Hi everyone, I'm Heidi Hess. I'm one of the co-directors of Credo Action and I am so glad that you're here with me today to talk about the fight to save the Supreme Court and stop Brett Kavanaugh. Um, I'm gonna pause and just take a minute to look at this slide because I actually think that it pretty accurately represents the threat that we have in front of us right now. Um, Trump is literally trying to take over the Supreme Court and he is trying to, to take away our ability to defend all of the things that we as progressives think are important. Um, he's doing that because that is his agenda and he's also doing that because that's the Republican Party's agenda. The Republican Party wants to take away women's rights. They want to roll back civil rights games for the LGBTQ community, for black people. Um, they want to close our borders to immigrants and terrorize the immigrants that are already here. Uh, they want to undermine our efforts to protect the environment and instead turn power back and ever more to corporations. Um, and they want to suppress uh, our right to, to represent ourselves and take away our right to vote. Um, and so the way that Trump is doing that uh, is going to, if he does it through the courts, it's going to last longer than his presidency. It's going to last for a generation. Um, and so I just, you know, quick reminder, Justice Kennedy resigned and um, Trump uh, uh, nominated Brett Kavanaugh. And Brett Kavanaugh represents everything that Republicans want and everything that we stand to lose. Um, I want to just click to some headlines that uh, I think help to capture sort of all of the places that he stands against the things we believe in. Um, he, you know, he ruled against an immigrant uh, who was asking to have an abortion. Um, and it, and uh, this is a headline in a major abortion ruling, Kavanaugh offers clues of how he might handle divisive issue on the Supreme Court. The answer is he will overturn Roe when he gets the chance. Um, when it comes to the birth control benefit that is, uh, was a historic part of Obamacare, his stance on birth control could be bad news for women. Um, if Kavanaugh is confirmed, you can kiss the right to vote goodbye. We're going to miss competitive elections when they're gone. And if they're gone, we know that the people that will be uh, threatened the most are the people who they are trying to keep from having access. Um, LGBT rights groups, Kavanaugh is a direct threat. Um, another threat to Obamacare, Republicans have been trying to overturn it for years. Um, we know that one of the places that they will try is the court. Brett Kavanaugh is a threat to Obamacare as well. Um, and then the last one, here's how Kavanaugh could deal a big blow to gun control. So all of the progressive issues that we care about, Kavanaugh represents a threat. Um, and I want to specifically focus for just a moment, uh, you know, these two in the stare off here. Um, Robert Mueller's investigating Trump for uh, potential collusion uh, with the Russian government to influence our elections. Um, he is going to potentially ask Trump to testify. He's going to subpoena Trump. He may uh, try to indict people much closer to Trump than the ones he's already indicted. Trump is desperately trying with all of his might to end Mueller's investigation. He recently asked his attorney general to end the investigation, a clear obstruction of justice. Um, and he has picked a Supreme Court nominee who is, is historically against the kind of power that Mueller has right now to investigate Trump and who has an extreme desire to, <laughs> an extreme desire to expand executive power. Trump is not a president who should have more executive power. Trump is not a president who should be given a get out of jail free card by the Supreme Court. But if you look at just some recent headlines, then we can see that perhaps the Kavanaugh pick was a quite, a, was a, uh, an intentional one on Trump's part to give him that kind of pass. So uh, Trump, I would put the, I mean, uh, Kavanaugh, I would put the final nail in the independent counsel precedent. Um, presidents shouldn't be distracted by criminal investigations. Trump's Supreme Court nominee argued presidents should be shielded from all criminal, pr criminal probes, even questioning. So all of the progressive values that we care about are under threat. Our democracy is under threat if Trump is allowed to put someone on Supreme Court who's going to keep him immune from consequences for, um, potential, for his potential collusion with Russia. Um, 
I want to talk a little bit about, I'm going to go back to this one for just a second. Um, it's going to be hard to win. Reminder, right, that after Antonin Scalia died, Republicans obstructed President Obama's pick, Merrick Garland, and kept him from appointing someone to the Supreme Court until after the elections. That is not only because they tried to obstruct Obama at every turn, and not only because the inherent racism of their party uh, made it almost impossible for them ever to give legitimacy to a black president. It's also because they understand how important these seats on the court are. They are not going to give this seat up without a fight, but there is a path for us to win. A narrow, narrow path, and we are going to have to fight hard. But it's a path, and we can win. So I want to talk about what that path looks like. I think of it about it as 49 plus 1. So if, if John McCain, who's senator from Arizona, continues to be absent from the Senate while he is fighting brain cancer, then we need 50 votes to block Kavanaugh. Um, and so I want to talk first about the 49. If, we were, if, if you were a live audience instead of live on Facebook, I would ask for some audience participation and see what folks think the 49 are, but I'll just tell you. Um, the 49 are the Senate Democrats. Right? So this is the Senate Democratic Caucus. It's 49 people. It's made up of people from states all over the country. Some of them are progressive champions. Some of them are more moderate. Um, already, as can be expected, there's many progressive champions who have come out strongly against Kavanaugh. Senator Warren, Senator Sanders, Senator Harris. They are against Kavanaugh. They have been clear where they stand. There are other senators who have also come out against Kavanaugh who you might not expect. Uh, so as an example, Senator Bob Casey from Pennsylvania. Trump won his state in 2016. Casey's up for re-election right now. He has been clear that Kavanaugh will not have his vote. He's been clear about that because he made a decision that standing in firm opposition to Trump was a strategy that would help him show the people of Pennsylvania that he is willing to resist Trump and resist Trump's uh, dangerous agenda. Um, there are other Democrats who have not yet come out and said where they stand. Some of them are saying that they're waiting to see how Kavanaugh will respond in his confirmation hearing. Some of them have said they want to hear from the voters in, the, in their states. It is not a question <laughs> of what we will learn about Kavanaugh in his confirmation hearings. We are not going to be surprised that he is an extremist. We are not going to be surprised that somehow he isn't one. We know that he's an extremist. We know the things that he stands against, and no Democrat really should be in a position right now where they have any questions about that. Unfortunately, there are Democrats who have questions about that, and so I want to highlight just a few of those folks uh, because part of getting to the 49 is going to be getting them to, to stick with uh, the rest of us. So there are three Democrats who voted for Neil Gorsuch, which was Donald Trump's first Supreme Court nominee. Joe Manchin in West Virginia, Heidi Heitkamp in North Dakota, and Joe Donnelly in Indiana. They all are in states that voted for Trump in 2016. They are all up for re-election in November. They need to hear loud and clear from the people in their states that the people in their state do not want to turn the Supreme Court over to Donald Trump. That the people in their states do not want to lose health insurance. They do not want to go back to a time when they are not able to afford to take care of their or their loved ones' pre-existing conditions. They do not want women to lose their access to health care and abortion. They don't actually want corporations to have more power than workers. They don't want corporations to be able to poison the air and the water in their state. Um, that they want to live in communities where everybody in their community is safe and respected and not threatened or afraid. So they need to hear that because they need to understand that the people in their state understand the stakes of this fight. Um, I'll add a few more people to this list. So um, Senator Doug Jones uh, was elected uh, in Alabama uh, after Gorsuch was confirmed. There are some folks really doing great work to pressure him in Alabama already. It's really important that we help amplify that pressure and that he gets the message loud and clear that he was elected to stand up to Trump and not to 
not to, not to play to the middle. Um, similarly, John Tester and Claire McCaskill are also two uh, Senate Democrats who are in red states. Uh, McCaskill is meeting with Kavanaugh next week, um, and uh, they similarly need to be reminded of what the values of the Democratic Party are and what the values of the people in their states are. Um, so, so here's, these are the six, um, but I want to sort of wrap the 49 in sort of one. This is Senate, Senator Chuck Schumer. He's from New York. He's the head of the Senate Democrats. He has, he has a very important job. His job is to lead the Senate Democratic Caucus. It is, it is a job that requires, in this moment, fierce resistance to Donald Trump whenever that is required, which is all the time. There's really no reason that any Senate Democrat should be compromising with Trump, and especially not the man who's supposed to be leading the Democrats. At Credo, we, for many reasons, uh, we're in San Francisco, we, we don't depend as much as some organizations on funding from sort of establishment foundations. And so we really think that one of our important jobs is to hold the left flank of the Democratic Party and to really stand up for the progressive values of the party. And from that position, we, we, we've, we've gone around the block a few times with Senator Schumer. Um, we have uh, critiqued Senator Schumer for uh, even before Trump was inaugurated. Uh, making it seem like maybe there would be things up with, uh, you know, with which he could work uh, with Trump. Um, we, we, have, we have gone around, uh, literally gone around the block with Senator Schumer after uh, he failed to use the government shutdown to actually protect dreamers. Uh, we drove a billboard truck around Washington, D.C. that said, uh, worst negotiator in Washington with his picture on it. Um, we do those things because we feel that as the leader of the Democrats, he is especially accountable to standing up for progressive values. And we are finding, unfortunately, in this fight, that he is once again refusing to lead in the way that we need. So um, this, is a, this is an article, I think, that, that, uh, that sums it up. Schumer plays the long game avoids hardball with centrist Democrats over the Supreme Court pick. The top Democrat in the Senate has vowed to fight President Trump's Supreme Court nominee with everything he's got. Just don't expect him to crack down on his red state Democrats who go rogue and back Brett, Judge Brett Kavanaugh. So when it, it's important, I think, to sort of look at this whole sentence. He's going to fight with everything he's got but he's not gonna crack down if there's Democrats who go rogue and back Kavanaugh. He's the leader of the Democrats. It is completely reasonable to assume that one of the things or many of the things that he's got is the ability, whether publicly or privately, to hold red state Democrats accountable for progressive values and to hold red state Democrats accountable for blocking Brett Kavanaugh. He's not, so far, shown that he's doing that. And so for us, along with the pressure in the states on the Democrats that we know need to feel pressure, we feel it's really, really important to pressure Schumer as well. Um, I want to move from Schumer to talk really briefly about the plus one. This is Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski. They're senators from Alaska and Maine. Um, they... Uh, they say that they are pro-choice senators. They are desperately, desperately, desperately right now trying to pretend <laughs> that Brett Kavanaugh does not put Roe at risk. They are fooling themselves, lying, trying to wiggle their way out of a no vote on Kavanaugh. Um, this is another place where we need to put pressure on senators. They have to understand, and we're working with our partners at NARAL and our partners at Planned Parenthood and so many other allies to help make sure they understand and that their constituents understand that a vote for Kavanaugh is a vote to end Roe. Um, they should hear that loud and clear. They should hear that every day. They are currently saying that there's not as much 
um, as much fire in their constituents as there was around health care, we need to turn the fire up and make sure that they're hearing us loud and clear. You might be thinking, in terms of the plus one, aren't there some Republicans who have said they're retiring, who said they're a little bit tired of Trump, who maybe are trying to defend our democracy a little bit? Maybe they would say, oh, you know, a president who is under investigation for colluding with a foreign government, maybe that guy should not get to appoint someone to the Supreme Court. Yes. Probably these guys that you're thinking about. It's Tennessee Senator Bob Corker and uh, Arizona Senator Jeff Flake. I actually think this picture is kind of perfect because what's actually true about both of these uh, senators is that they have paid a little lip service to try and hold Trump accountable. They have like expressed a little bit of discomfort with, oh, maybe he goes a little bit too far. They have nothing to lose because they are not running for re-election and they consistently show that they are not gonna stand up for the things that they say. So I think this picture is kind of perfect. I think, you know, Corker is saying like, please do not, do not even talk to me about this. And Flake is trying to look like he does not even see that we are in the room. So I think that what's true is that it is, it is disappointing and it is telling of the current Republican Party that they are more interested in, in partisan game than really any set of values. Uh, but the real hope of getting some Republican votes is with Collins and Murkowski. Um, I want to talk very quickly about sort of one other piece of strategy that Democrats are using, I think, fairly well at the moment, and I think it's important that, that we help amplify. Um, Brett Kavanaugh was, the, was in the Bush White House for a long time, and he is the Supreme Court nominee with the biggest paper trail in history. Elena Kagan also worked in the White House. And when she was nominated to be on the Supreme Court, Republicans demanded to see all of the documentation from her time in the White House before they would consider her nomination. Democrats have now made the same request around Kavanaugh. And not at all surprisingly, Republicans have said no. Republicans have asked for an extremely limited set of documents and the National Archive has said that those documents will not be available until October. The Republicans have nonetheless scheduled Kavanaugh's confirmation hearings for September, the first week in September. So they are trying very desperately to bury these documents and make sure that they don't come out. We have a lot of allies who've been asking, you know, one of the very important questions, what <laughs> are they hiding? And I think what they might be hiding is, is a lot. And I think it's important, both in terms of what we might learn about Kavanaugh and also important because I think it can provide leverage for senators to be able to ask for the documents and, and, and sort of stand their ground in not being willing to vote, to vote yes. So when Kavanaugh was in the White House, here are things that people believe he touched. Issues around abortion rights, including the global gag rule. After 9-11, issues of torture, issues of rendition, issues about civil liberties in terms of how much overreach uh, agencies like the NSA uh, were doing and whether they were inappropriately spying on Americans, uh, marriage equality, cuts to Social Security and Medicaid, uh, conversations about affirmative action, uh, a push against the assault weapons ban. Um, and then I think sort of just circling back to the conversation about Mueller, um, George Bush, Used, uh, used a strategy to try to exert executive authority over Congress that was called signing statement. So he would sign a bill into law, but then he would add some, some extra documentation that would talk about what he didn't like and what he thought shouldn't be followed in that law. There was a huge, huge uproar about this because it was an abuse of executive authority. And Kavanaugh was right at the center of it, um, helping draft those uh, and being involved in, in promoting those. Um, so we know that there's, there's stuff there. We know that there will be things that, will make, that might make Kavanaugh seem like an even worse pick <laughs> than he already seems to many of us. And, and that's why Republicans are trying to keep us from seeing those documents. And remember that this is not, we can't do this one over. If the documents come out in October and they show things that are appalling and beneath a Supreme Court justice, but he's been confirmed, 
We don't get do-overs with the Supreme Court. We don't get to try again later. This is a lifetime appointment for someone who is, who we know has things in his <laughs> paper trail past that would make him likely unqualified for being on the bench. Um, so senators, Democratic senators are, are fighting for this and the Republicans, of course, are pushing back. Uh, but it is an, an angle of attack that I think helps, um, is potentially very useful for red state Democrats because it is a little bit less perhaps about the issues or a little bit less about maybe the things that they feel that they can't touch and more about uh, the way that Republicans are hiding Kavanaugh's record. Um, so about to be done. Um, I just want to sort of remind folks of so how we think we get to 49 and how we think we get to 1. So what we're doing at Credo, and we hope that you will join us, is we're putting a lot of national and in-state pressure on, George, on Chuck Schumer. We're working with allies, uh, especially in-state, to put in-state pressure on the senators in Indiana, West Virginia, North Dakota, Alabama, a little bit in Montana and Missouri. And then for the 1, Again, we may we want to do everything we can to make sure that Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski feel feel that the pressure is on them to make the right decision when it comes to the Kavanaugh vote. Um, so here's some things that you can do if you want to join us in trying to save the court. Um, the first thing you can do is spread the word. It's actually really important that people understand what's at stake right now. So the more you can talk with the people that you that are in your circles about why you're going to fight to save the court, the better. Um, we have a bunch of petitions that you could sign and share, both to highlight what's at stake, to target key senators, to demand the release of documents, and to keep the pressure on Schumer. All of us should be calling Senator Schumer. If you're in New York, you can do more than that. You can visit his office. You can deliver petitions. You can go to a protest. You should rally your friends in target states to make calls and visit offices and deliver petitions and join local events. Um, there's a bunch of events happening on August 26th. Um, there are events happening really all the time because people are really, local groups are really trying to keep the pressure on. Um, and then the sort of final thing is the, that senators are starting to meet with Kavanaugh, Democratic senators. And the hearings are going to start in September. So it's really important that we keep our eyes and our ears and our voices on those moments when Kavanaugh will be back in the public eye. We should make sure that Senate members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, the Democrats on that committee, are fierce in their opposition during the hearings. Um, we should make sure that um, our senators who meet with Kavanaugh um, understand that we, we expect them to block him. Um, and we should be paying attention and elevating things in, uh, in social media that we think are important to help tell the story. Um, here's, here's where you can go and get some links to taking action or um, doing a little bit more. We hope that you will. Um, we feel like this fight, I feel like this fight, and I know the Credo Action Team feels like this fight, is one of the most important uh, of our lives because we are defending progressive values for our generation and many generations to come, and so we certainly hope that you guys will join us. Um, I think we have a couple of questions from the studio audience, as it were. Um, I'll take those quickly. Um, so Elsa O from Connecticut asked a great question. She says, "My senators care; they're on the right side. But how can I make it? So how can I make an impact in states where it does matter?" So just going back to going back to this, right, for, for Elsa. Schumer, 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 <laughs> right? We have to actually make sure that he understands that his leadership is at stake. We have to make sure that he knows, you know, if you call him and he says, I'm going to vote no, <laughs> and then you say, that is great. I'm counting on you for 48 more. <laughs> if you call and his office says, he's doing everything he can, then you say, then I expect that 49 Democrats will vote no on Kavanaugh. He needs to understand that we get it, that we're holding him accountable to his whole job and not just to his individual vote or not just to his best work. So, and then the other thing that we can do if we live in states, I live in California, but if we live in states that where we, our senators are sort of on the, on the good side of this is to really find our friends in states where it matters more and, and, and ask them to take action. Um, so those are, those are my two thoughts for Elsa. Um, 
Um, I have another question. Um, this is a good one. This one I also get asked by uh, reporters a lot. Um, wouldn't it be bad if Schumer publicly asked red state Dems to vote no? Wouldn't that just backfire? And maybe, maybe if they voted no and people said they voted on, uh, they voted, um, they voted uh, because Schumer told them to. Maybe, maybe they would lose the Senate seat, um, and and that wouldn't be good, right? So I want to talk about that just for a second because I think that's really important. Uh, a really important argument that it's really important that we sort of debunk. One, Schumer's only, Schumer does not only have one tactic for asking red state Dems to do the right thing. Publicly calling on them to do the right thing is not the only tool in his toolkit. He has leverage behind the scenes. He has leverage in decisions that he makes about who he includes in his leadership team, about who gets committee positions. He has decisions that he can make that will not necessarily put red state Democrats on the spot. And he should be doing all of them. It would be fine if he does everything behind the scenes and we get 49 votes. We are not seeing that that's the path he's on right now. So we will see. And then the other part that I just want to sort of talk about is what if they vote for Kavanaugh and then we lose the seat? I think Democrats for a very long time have decided that their electoral strategy is to come to the middle. So if they are in a tight race, if they are in a red state, if Republicans are attacking them, they want to come to the compromise position to try to win moderate voters. It's not been working, and it betrays the core values of our party. It betrays women, it betrays immigrants, it betrays workers, it betrays the environment. It is a false choice, in my opinion, <laughs> that we cannot both fight for progressive values and win elections in red states. <laughs> and so we see that there's momentum to think that the Senate seat is at risk and perhaps more important than the Supreme Court seat. And I think that it's really important to remember that the kind of, the, the leadership that Bob Casey's showing in Pennsylvania, right, is the leadership that we need from every Democrat. We need every Democrat to be able, willing to risk their political stability for our values. And this is, this is not risking it for a piece of legislation that could get overturned. This is risking it for the Supreme Court for a generation. And so I think that we want to start challenging the story that we have to protect the seat by letting red state Dems off the hook and start doing more to push all Democrats to be more more in line with our values. I don't think there's any more questions. So with that, I think we'll close it. Thanks everybody for joining. Um, see you the next time.